It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brandon Chapman. He is the Assistant Professor of Anthropology. He earned his PhD from Washington State University and has lived and worked in the Arctic. This is his third year living in Ketchikan. Will you please help me and welcome him? <laughs> Cheers. Hope they can hear me without a mic or anything. Uh, even talk of the Arctic brings Arctic weather, apparently. So thank you all for coming out, even for Texas I suppose, quote unquote, Arctic weather. So, um, title of the talk here, uh, try to do this title right. Inunashikput Iyugu Nunauanun, mapping and participating in the Inupak way of life in the Arctic. The uh, Inupak uh, form of the title there. Roughly translated means uh, representing the new <coughs> way of life through maps. <coughs> the Unachsikput meaning uh, new way of life. So uh, I'm Brandon Chapman, Assistant Professor of Anthropology here at the Ketchikan campus, as uh, Shelley was so nice to tell you. Uh, and this is actually a topographic map uh, of the uh, of our study area, if you will, or where we're looking, of uh, the Northwest Arctic uh, here tonight, the Northwest Arctic region south of the North Slope. Okay. So we'll get into this as we go through the talk. And uh, this is the Kotzebue uh, uh, Peninsula right here. And uh, some of the, uh, we'll look at some of the surrounding uh, communities and just the way of life. Uh, talk about a subsistence mapping project that I was involved with and how this can more generally maybe speak to this sort of project, spoke to protecting Alaska Native subsistence rights, uh, hunting, gathering, fishing rights uh, up there, and also maybe how it could be applied to other uh, peoples uh, across the state and <coughs> other places. Uh, as a note, uh, Sonic took. Uh, I use this when I uh, give this talk. I've given it in Lower 48. Uh, this is my Eskimo uh, name, uh, a Newbach name. I was fortunate enough, I suppose I made enough friends to be uh, inducted and become part of the uh, society up there, so I was given uh, the uh, honorable name there. Uh, so, the little story behind this, uh, if you care, <coughs> is that if you go to a, uh, so Kotzebue is right up here on this peninsula here, if any of you are familiar. Actually, before we start, and I tell the story, how many have been? Uh, to anywhere in the northwest Arctic or the north, north Slope. Kotzebue, Barrow, the village, anywhere. Okay, so a few. Okay, so I just want to, Kathleen back there too, great. So just want to get a little sense of uh, our experience. So if you go to uh, this little inlet, well, actually not a kind of large inlet back here, uh, <coughs> uh, behind Kotzebue, and you go to the northeast corner of that inlet where I'm sort of pointing right there, shakily, it's not me, it's the pointer, sorry. Um, <laughs> you will find an actual point named Sonic Tuk. Uh, it means, uh, when it's applied to a place, it means sort of a uh, place of bones. Uh, when applied to a person like me, uh, it means bone hunter. So I had, uh, I'm an anthropologist by training, archeology is involved with that. So I was fortunate enough, I had a dream job as an anthropologist working with the Northwest Arctic Borough, the borough government, uh, up, in, uh, up in the Northwest Arctic, the stories I'm gonna tell you about here. You saw a lot of pictures that I took uh, in the slideshow before I uh, started the PowerPoint here. Uh, when you were walking in, those were, uh, th those were sort of my, uh, my pictures that I took over the few years I was there. Anyway, uh, I would come in in the afternoons and I was working with an elder named John Goodwin, uh, who became a very good friend of mine. Uh, he was in his 70s at the time, former head of the, uh, former chair of the Federal Ice Seal Commission, uh, a Newbach uh, elder uh, out of Kotzebue. And uh, anyway, uh, he would, uh, I would come, you know, in the office we were in, uh, my job was to sort of sit around and listen to stories like John would tell of the old days uh, when I was uh, working for the borough, so that was a very nice part of the job. Anyway, uh, he, would, uh, he would see me sort of looking at all these artifacts that we had in the office uh, from all the archeological sites around the borough. And so when he saw this, uh, he said, oh, this is something you really like. You're a bone person, so you're a bone hunter, so I'll give you that name. So it was very, very much an honor to be inducted into the, uh, into the society and very much, uh, John's still very much a good friend of mine, so. Okay, so a little caveat. Um, I give this talk in the lower 48 where people know nothing about the state. So I'm going to go through like the first four or five slides. It's not going to be long. Indulge me. You'll see if I sort of try to debunk the stereotypes that people have of Alaska. Maybe you can tell me if I'm doing a good job or not. Because, you know, even academics, a lot of people don't know anything about Alaska. Okay. So I have to like start out with these sort of stereotypes and then say what, you know, people in Alaska are not this and native people in Alaska are not this. Okay. So. Because I give it, you know, talk. I've given this talk at universities, other places. So you'll tell me if I'm right or wrong on these things. Just generally about Alaska. Maybe we'll have a few laughs to start off with before we get into more detailed things that you don't necessarily know about. These first things you're going to know about. So I start with Alaska's really big, right? Uh, 
it's huge. You can fit, you know, my goodness, we know that, uh, but people down in lower 48 often don't know that. Uh, you can fit many of the, you know, plain states, the, the Midwest. I'm originally from Illinois. You can fit Illinois in there. I always told my folks, my parents, uh, I worked in a school district. I was a, a village teacher for a year before I came to Ketchikan, a uh, village on the Mid-Yukon, after I worked in, uh, in the Northwest Arctic. And I would tell my folks, you know, the school district I worked in was the size of Indiana, you know. They didn't uh, really, you know, I think, really get a sense of what that was like. You know, eight schools spread over the size of Indiana. So the point is, is that there are obviously a lot of people, a lot of different environments in the state, and, you know, we're, we live in a very large and diverse uh, place, right? Um, yes, yeah, so you could fit all of Eastern Europe and some of Central Europe in there. You know, the western part stretches from Portugal all the way to the Near East and Turkey and all that. Okay, it's humongous, great. And yes, for those in the lower 48 too, I'll put this in there too, you can fit a lot of the western states, California, Montana, South Dakota, Idaho, some of the Northeast, some of the Mid-Atlantic, Kentucky, Maryland, Virginia, okay, you get the picture. <coughs> so the point is I try to paint this picture that, you know, again, Alaska, you know, many different types of environments, you know, we have uh, a wide diversity, and just look, you know, where we are tonight, we're here in the southeastern corner of the state, right, and we're talking about the northwest corner, where a lot of us may not have a lot of experience, most of us have not been, um, and the point is, you know, um, that there are a lot of stereotypes about Alaska too, right? Um, well, you know, uh, I've given this talk in Indiana before at an alma mater of mine, and uh, I have family members too that, you know, they ask me like, so do you know the Bush people? Uh, uh, okay. So, yeah, so obviously these are sort of stereotypes of our state, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll link this to Alaska Natives in a second, okay? But just indulge me a little bit. So, you know, yes, uh, obviously, you know, we are very much a hunting, fishing, uh, other sort, you know, types of people. Certainly, we're not all living off the grid in the backwoods, of course, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So I kind of talk about that and that, yes, we're not all, you know, bearded or mustached uh, guys in coveralls, you know, out in the uh, logs, out in the uh, forest, uh, searching for gold on the gold rush, that sort of thing. So, you know, obviously, you know, uh, we have uh, jobs, we have other things, we have many different types of things here, just like any other state would. And so we're definitely not the stereotype. Maybe we have a lot of extra tough boots, uh, boots uh, here in uh, Ketchikan. Maybe that's the one thing that we live up to. But other than that, certainly we're not. Uh, we're not what they show on TV. I've actually, I'm from Illinois originally. Like I said, I've, I've had two uncles and an aunt. Some, all of them college educated, by the way, uh, ask me, um, uh, do you know the Bush people? And have you seen igloos when you're up in the Arctic? Um, so these are the sort of stereotypes, so this is kind of linking it to natives too. Obviously, we're not the deadliest catch folks. I know we have a lot of fishing here, of course, out of our own community in Sitka, but, you know, it's not like waves are, you know, trying to constantly slap us into the ocean and all that sort of stuff, at least not most of the time. So, you know, but linking this to, it's not just stereotypes about, you know, Alaska in general, it's also about Alaska natives, and specifically people of the Arctic. Um, you know, when you talk to people in the lower 48, They'll mention the igloo as sort of like a, you know, like, have you seen that? You know, it's like, I, I hear these questions like, what are you talking about? You know, uh, of course not. <laughs> the igloo, of course, is not, you know, something that uh, certainly the, the Alaskan Arctic people have never used, uh, you know, sod homes, other things like that, you know, earth ground sort of homes, you know, traditionally, quote unquote, traditionally, that's what uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, you know, Inupak people have <laughs> used, you know, way before uh, European contact, but certainly nothing uh, even remotely close to the igloo. So, you know, these are the sorts of stereotypes you have to combat. And so when we talk about, you know, there we go. And uh, by the way, so uh, as I go through this talk here, uh, these photos, uh, most of these are mine. Some of these are also uh, from, uh, uh, very nice that some friends uh, from the uh, North of Stardic have uh, allowed me to use these, uh, some of these as well. So when we think about uh, Inupak people, uh, people of uh, Alaska Native people of the Arctic region of our state, this is more what is important uh, to those folks and what daily life sort of looks like, okay? Uh, so we want to sort of bust the stereotypes here. Uh, just going from top left to bottom right, you know, we have a family out on Kotzebue Sound, uh, you know, bringing, uh, uh, you know, out on the boat there uh, on a nice, uh, you know, spring day. We've got uh, what, uh, you know, many folks down here are a little more familiar with, uh, drying fish and putting up fish on the racks, right? Uh, so we've got uh, a lady there on the Sasulik, which is a uh, summer campsite. Uh, near Kotzebue, we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, putting up uh, putting up fish there uh, at fish camp, summer camp. We have uh, Newbach Elder here, uh, out of Kivalina, uh, down on his uh, ATV four-wheeler, uh, you know, uh, uh, out there. Uh, one of the things that I'm not going to talk about tonight, uh, and for further study, if anybody's interested, uh, if you do not know, there have been uh, actually a fair amount of studies done on this, a lot of research. Uh, 
the elderly and what are considered the extreme elderly, meaning those that are 70 and older, and you talk, some of the most, some of the most healthiest by most uh, well-being indicators of any population, especially native population uh, in Alaska and in the lower 48. Um, uh, I can say just from my own experience up there just a few years, I was up there in Kotzebue and the, and the surrounding communities, uh, it was quite a thing to see not only those that are, you know, say 60 or older, but those that are in their 70s, even in their 80s, actively out walking around, uh, some riding on ATVs, uh, in generally very good health, um, and all those sorts of things, uh, you know, just, and actively going out, say, like ice fishing, things like that, that don't necessarily require a lot of uh, physical activity, but still, you know, getting out there and doing those sorts of things, really, uh, really nice to see. So, uh, the elderly tend to stay very uh, well connected to their families, very active, and so that's kind of a tangent beyond what uh, is the scope of this talk, but still something interesting if you all are uh, um, interested in that sort of thing. I can certainly refer you to some, uh, to some studies that, uh, that show that. And then we have a, uh, uh, um, a new Buck Hunter out here on the uh, breaking up sea ice uh, with binoculars looking out, uh, looking out uh, probably uh, looking for a, marine, uh, for a seal or uh, searching the, uh, the horizon there on the Kotzebue Sound. So the point is, this is what daily life uh, you know, looks like here. We'll talk about the importance of the hunting, fishing, gathering way of life. Now understand, I try to use that, that term, hunting, fishing, gathering way of life, as much as possible. Obviously, you know, here other places in the state, you get the term subsistence uh, as sort of a shorthand. Uh, obviously, that can be some, kind of a controversial term, especially from the Native perspective. Uh, I will probably throw that term in once in a while, but understand, you know, as uh, uh, as, as you know, most uh, Native people around the state see it, it's, it's better to refer to uh, that instead of subsistence, but I'll probably throw that term in there just to let you know, but I certainly prefer not, uh, not to use it when I can. And just one more thing here in Alaska. So, you know, this is the other thing I sort of, I sort of emphasize is that, you know, these are the main transportation corridors in the state, of course, the road system, uh, you know, in the red there and the maroon color, you've got the, uh, the railroad there. Oh, sorry, back, uh, back. Um, You've got the railroad there in the, uh, in the orange, and then you've got, of course, what we're familiar with, uh, mostly the Marine Highway in the blue, stretching from Keshkan <coughs> down to South Central all the way over to Dutch Harbor on the southwest. The point is, is that, you know, much of our state is in this, you know, west and northern part. Uh, and obviously here we'll be focusing on this region, the Northwest Arctic, tonight. And so, you know, this is a region that, one of the things that struck me when coming to Alaska is that just how many people have not been to that part of the state. Uh, unless you have a specific job that takes you there, you know, maybe you're with one of the communication companies, or maybe you're working as, you know, maybe a nurse or something, go to one of the health clinics, or your teacher, maybe go bush teach, something like that. Other than that, a lot of people don't necessarily, have not necessarily been to those other off-the-road places in the state. And so I was kind of struck by that, by, you know, the many times that I've gone to Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau, and, you know, all the, all the cities, if you will, uh, just how little people knew about uh, this, you know, the, what is geographically the, the big part of our state, right? That sort of off-the-road area where, you know, in Ubok, Ubik, and of course down here, the, um, uh, the Unong and the Aleuts and others live. So anyway, uh, this is what's going to be sort of the focus of our uh, talk here this evening. So anthropologists, uh, and again, I, uh, actually this is uh, Bobby Schaefer here, uh, uh, one of the guys I worked with the borough with on the right, so with his friend there out, uh, out hunting uh, on Cotsview Sound. So. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm sorry. I, I don't. I don't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get everybody's name. I didn't meet everybody when I was up there. But uh, um, anyway. Uh, so as an anthropologist, uh, we do what is called ethnography. Ethnography meaning the study of ethno meaning ethnic groups. So basically, the study of ethnic groups or different peoples of the world. Okay. So I'm just going to sort of run through the ethnographic basics here. Uh, for those that are not familiar, we have a lot of different uh, knowledge backgrounds here in the audience. So uh, again, bear with me if you uh, if you know already know some of these things. But just some of the basics here. Of the, uh, of the people. So, first of all, obviously, um, linguistically, we uh, classify as uh, Inuit uh, and culturally classify as Inuit here. So, uh, the Inupak would more generally be called the Alaskan Arctic Inuit. Uh, obviously, having those relations, uh, general uh, linguistic relations with the Inuit peoples across Canada, Greenland, and those parts of the Arctic. Okay, so they have those general uh, sort of linkages there. Um, also, just, you know, general <coughs> cultural similarities as well. Okay. Uh, I emphasize this too. Now, I can speak uh, for this, uh, for the Northwest Arctic. I cannot speak for it for the North Slope. The North Slope may be different. My experience is in the Northwest Arctic. I've been up to Barrow and places in the North Slope, but most of my experience is in the Nana region. Um, I try to emphasize the term Anubiak over Anubiak. 
uh, if you look at the language, the term Inupiat obviously exists, the, the one with the T ending. Um, and you look at the sort of, a, you, you look at the translations of this, a Inupiat can be used to say, I'm an Inupiat person, or, you know, a Inupiat way of life, that sort of thing. And the, and the one with the T ending, the Inupiat, uh, tends to be used as a plural version, or at least that's what the, that's what the, the translations say. I have not heard anyone in the Northwest Arctic ever utter the word Inupiat with the T ending before. It was always with the Q ending. So I try to emphasize this, uh, you know, when I give this talk, the Q ending rather than the T ending. A lot of academics will use the T ending that have never been up or never set foot in the Arctic region and, and use the T ending. Um, so I, I tend to emphasize that the Q ending is what you most often hear uh, when you go to the Northwest Arctic. So Inupiat, and sometimes the I is a little bit, uh, you know, English uh, speakers can oftentimes em emphasize the I, like Anubiyak, like that. Uh, the I, at least from the elders, the others that I talked to uh, in this region, tended to uh, bring the I down a bit, so it was like Anubiyak or Anubiyak, like that, uh, said like that, so just as a, as a, as a note there. Um, Archaeology, other things, tells us, tells, uh, you know, about uh, 12,000 or so uh, years before present settlement of the area, so, you know, over 10,000 years, okay? Um, so we've got, you know, a fair amount of long time settlement, uh, population, you know, about 13,500 or so across the two Arctic boroughs. Uh, I think it's about 7,000 or 8,000 in the Northwest Arctic, uh, region. And also, uh, the, uh, the, you know, we talked about the linguistic anthropology, the cultural anthropology, uh, these other things, the physical anthropology, the body type, uh, for those that have not been up there, um, there is, uh, it sounds maybe kind of crude, but it's actually, a, uh, uh, scientifically, proven thing, sort of body type here, you get a people that live in an environment for tens of thousands of years, like the Inupiaq, and you get specific physical adaptations that you can see across a population, physical changes over time, evolution. And so, Inupiaq tend to have this, this specific type of body type that's very different from other body types in the world, where it tends to be uh, fairly short, fairly stout, uh, sort of short legs, uh, thin legs, uh, not much hip, very broad midsection, chest area, and that sort of body type. Um, this is actually something that if you talk to folks up there, uh, I talk to a lot of them, you know, uh, uh, people tend to know this and joke about it, uh, you know, know about it so it's nothing uh, nothing too controversial. So I remember my, uh, I remember John Goodwin, the elder I, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, he said, oh, Brandon, you know, when you go talk and give this talk at other places, you can show them a picture of me and that's the sort of, you know, uh, the body type, right? So, uh, but anyway, so the point is, is though, that's, from an anthropological standpoint, it's, it makes sense. Uh, it's a body type that is, uh, that's sort of short and stout, uh, keeps heat in, uh, it, keeps, it keeps warm uh, compared to other body types in very cold environments. Take, for example, peoples of the tropics. It's very well known in anthropology, for example, uh, physical anthropology. There's a body style called, called the melodic body style, which is home in sub-Saharan Africa in the tropical regions of the world. It's basically kind of like, it's kind of similar to what I would be, like very tall, lean, thin, you know, very straight up, that sort of thing. That's very good for a hot environment. Much better suited for that over time, okay? So just to sort of give the contrast here, all right? So again, you know, very specific type of cultural, linguistic, physical styles here uh, that the new puck uh, well represent. And of course, you know, they're uh, related to uh, the different, this is a map here of the Inuit uh, of Canada, including the Nunavut uh, region uh, that was just designated uh, a couple decades ago. And so, you know, the ba uh, Baffin Island, all these other places. And so these are the relations, you know, uh, as far as we talk about Inuit uh, that the Inupiaq have uh, outside, of, uh, outside of Alaska. And obviously they have relations to Greenland. I show this uh, not just as an aside, um, people in the Northwest Arctic, the Inupiaq, you know, have good knowledge of these places. Uh, certainly some of the ones that work at like the Northwest Arctic Borough, uh, the hospitals, other places, have actually been to a lot of these places. Uh, you know, annually, semi-annually, we'll go to Nunavut, we'll go to Greenland, uh, we'll go to conferences with other Inuit peoples uh, across the Arctic. So it's not just something like, well, they're related, but they don't know each other, that sort of thing. Because, you know, these are very long distances here, obviously, between these places. They actually go and, uh, you know, uh, interact and, uh, and and they know of the issues because there are similar issues involving, you know, resource development, road development, oil development, mining, 
all of these other things, again, that we'll talk about a little bit more as we go along. So it's not just that, you know, only know about the North, you know, North Slope and Northwest Arctic, and you both only know each other. They also know uh, a good deal about what's going on in Inuit country, if you will, in other parts of the, uh, in other parts of the Arctic outside of Alaska. There we go. And of course, uh, and those especially that study these things here too are very uh, familiar with the uh, Alaska language map from the Alaska Native Language Center. And of course, this is just to emphasize, uh, again, the region that we're looking at here, the Inupak region. Uh, oh, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong one. Um, there we go. And so obviously this is where we're talking about, and again, we'll be zooming on, in on that in a little bit. And just understand too, linguistically, uh, going back, uh, uh, the Inupak tend to have general language similarities that are lumped in with the uh, central Yupik and also uh, the Aleut, or uh, uh, their native term, the uh, Unigan, uh, down in the uh, Aleutian Islands, and so there's actually an Eskimo uh, Aleut uh, language family. And so uh, that's generally the, the linguistic relations there, besides uh, the relations that you have uh, up in the Arctic, uh, across the Arctic uh, as well. Other things here, uh, understand the term traditionally. Anthropologists like to use that term. Uh, I put it in quotes, because when we say the term tra traditional generally means, when, when we refer to that, meaning pre-European contact, those things that were done before Europeans came, okay? So when I use the term, that's what I'm referring to. It's kind of shorthand. But we have to watch that term as well, because traditional, it can kind of imply that things don't change. Like people have a tradition and they don't, you know, it's kind of static. So I put that term in quotes, because just because I say something's traditional, you thought people say something's traditional, it doesn't mean that it changes, it, it, that it doesn't change. Tradition certainly can't change. But traditionally, of course, pre-European contact, there are semi-nomadic, meaning they, uh, you know, seasonally nomadic, uh, hunter-gatherer, fisher people. Summer camps, oh my goodness, summer camps are important up there. Uh, obviously, you know, we know about camps and things like that down here. Up there, it is huge, big deal. Um, Sasulik, a big, uh, big summer camp just across the sound from Kotzebue. Some of the houses over there are nicer than the, some of them in Kotzebue, let me tell you. Um, they bring in some of the prefab stuff uh, sometimes and, uh, and build up summer camp houses. Um, going out to the villages, places like that. The point is that summer camp is a big thing. Three, four months out of the year, uh, especially out in the villages that are on the various rivers, the Noatak, the, the, uh, the, the Kobuk River, the Selawik River, going from north to south respectively. People going up river in summer, uh, to go to summer camp to fish, to put up fish for the summer, that sort of thing, and for the fall. And so summer camp is still a very <coughs> big thing. Subsistence here is still a very big thing. Uh, dog teams, I emphasize that too because, you know, this has changed. Hunting, fishing, gathering, of course, uh, especially over the past few decades. Basically, dog teams went out of, uh, went, went out of uh, play as of the uh, 1970s, of course, as people in the state know. Um, but, uh, you know, very much, uh, very, you know, very much changed the speed at which subsistence was done. Uh, if anybody wants a good reference on that, I actually have an article with John Goodwin, uh, the elder I just mentioned, uh, Cultural Survival Quarterly. It was published a few years ago. He gives a very nice history uh, of, uh, of the transition from dog team to snow machine to ATV and how that really changed fundamentally the way that hunting, fishing, and gathering was done, the speed at which it was done. People would go out for months at a time when it was dog team, you know, and then it became sometimes still months, but it could be, you know, weeks or a day or a few days, that sort of thing, depending on how far you're going out and what you're getting. So the point is, you know, there are some traditions there and it's been melded with some modern stuff. This is very high subsistence reliant, reliant population. So um, it's not only compared to other Alaska natives, you know, across our state, but just, uh, you know, natives across the lower 48, especially. Uh, recent numbers, pretty consistent, about 50% of the daily diet uh, in the Northwest Arctic and North Slope uh, comes from wild, wild uh, gathered resources, hunting, fishing, gathering, okay? So that's big. <clears throat> obviously, these sorts of things are important for any native culture, obviously. Uh, very symbolic, very, you know, all that sort of stuff. But on a practical day-to-day -day basis, with the Inupak, Incredibly important. Uh, on a, now, this is an average, of course, uh, average over the households, okay, in this region. But 50% of the daily diet coming from wildly gathered resources, so subsistence at a, on a practical level, very important, okay? And so obviously then, you know, again, I sort of put this last point up here just for the lower 48 crowd, but obviously we know here about our uh, communities, our hubs, Cotsview Barrow, 
I know our various uh, communities that are up in these regions off the road, you know, obviously we have a lot of different uh, types of jobs, other things, and just like any other community, they're just off the road, okay? But there are differences. The subsistence reliance is certainly a big difference than you would find in other places, okay? What are those people doing? They are dragging a seal. Can you see the seal in a... Oh, way back there. Okay. Yes. Hunting uh, photos here, so we'll talk about hunting one more, too. So, well, that's actually a perfect point, perfect time to question. Uh, it's, this is to emphasize here, uh, when we talk about the Inupak culture, and I think they would, uh, you know, uh, Inupak people would emphasize this as well, uh, very much a hunting culture, okay? Um, very much, especially, uh, this is um, uh, Lance Kramer, I believe, uh, here out of Kotzebue, uh, uh, with Seal here. The point is, is that male identity especially, is tied up with hunting in this region. There are great surveys that have been done uh, past 15, 20 years. It still hold up today. Uh, survey of living conditions in the Arctic. They did a survey of 3,000, about 3,000 people out of the Northwest Arctic and North Slope region about what, you know, what subsistence activities do you participate in within one year? What, uh, you know, what other type of cultural activities do you, do, do you participate in? And what we see with the Inupak is that those sort of quote-unquote traditional gender roles even between male and female are still very much intact. Uh, you s hunting is primarily still a male activity up there. Now, obviously, you know, women hunt too, of course. That's not to say they don't. They do. Um, I knew some, you know, I, I worked with uh, uh, some Inupak women who are excellent hunters, better than their husbands. Uh, but that is to say that still... Um, you look at the numbers, you look at people, you know, doing what they say they do, and uh, it's still very much a, a primarily a male activity. Um, there's a reason why there's a lot of men in this photo uh, with the hunting photos, because that's primarily what it is. Uh, women still tend to do a lot of the, uh, you know, the weaving, uh, the basketry, the other sort of things that are sort of, sort of stereotypical traditional gender roles, uh, making the mukluks, you know, all the different uh, sort of clothing, all that sort of stuff, traditional wares, the parkas, all that stuff. Uh, but it's, it's very much to emphasize fishing is also very important too. gathering very important as well. We'll look at some of the numbers, but uh, hunting is very much tied up with this culture here. It is very much both marine mammal and caribou and other land mammals. Okay, so you get a sense of the culture. That's certainly what, uh, you know, can emphasize here. Thank you. I was going to ask that. You're whispering all the answers up here. So, uh, Hopefully nobody heard that. We can make a surprise. So, for those that don't know, we use these terms, you know, the big native groupings in the state, in Yubok, Yubik, you know, uh, Alut, uh, you know, Clinkett, all these others. Obviously, there are subgroups within those, right? And so, just as sort of a shorthand, obviously, there are many different subgroups that we don't have really time to get to in this talk. Um, one of the things that's sort of easy for folks elsewhere to remember, uh, and that is a major distinction for Inupak people is this sort of simple uh, distinction between coastal and inland, okay? Uh, that there are, you know, there's, there's dialect differences. There it's, uh, you know, you go to the Northwest Arctic region, uh, there, Inupak people can know, I've seen it done. Uh, first five words out of somebody's mouth, they'll be able to say, oh, you're from an inland community or you're from a coastal community, okay? Dialect differences in the way certain consonants are pronounced. So there are, there are those type of differences. And there are also, when we talk about the importance of the hunting, fishing, gathering way of life, there are actually major cultural differences between the coastal communities and the inland communities. So I just wanted to sort of make that distinction too as we talk about, um, as we talk about this part of the state. So obviously we're starting with the coastal, here with the picture. And so anybody besides you uh, know, know where this is uh, from the photo? Anybody know this community, Northwest Arctic? On the coast, not it's as south of Point Hope and Point Lay, because that's North Slope. I, I maybe go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's Kivalina. Kivalina. Yeah. So this is Kivalina. It's been kind of it's it been in the news a lot, even made national news, obviously state news too. Anybody know what's going on in Kivalina? Sort of the big story. Uh, it's falling eroding. Ocean. Falling into the ocean. Yeah, right. So this, yes. Yeah, so Kivalina is, you know, it's even made national news too. Sort of the uh, one of the communities of climate change. Actually, it's kind of funny here. I'll show. Well, not funny, but uh, show us uh, tell a story here. So Kivalina's on the coast. It's about 450 people or so. 
Um, you walk uh, from the airstrip here, uh, and you walk down into the town. About a third of the way in, you go into this little cluster of buildings. The IRA building is there, about three, uh, three buildings from the coastline there, the rocky coastline. You step into the IRA, the traditional council building in Kivalina. You walk through the Eskimo entry, you go right into the main room, and you take a look on the right, and you will see seven photos lined up on the wall. 1960s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010, 2016, current day. And you will see the coastline, I wish I could have, you know, I, sh I should have taken a picture of it, but basically every decade, the coastline going in like this, and basically up to the present day. It's like, I mean, it's literally <coughs> like, you know, section, 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 all the way off. You can literally see it. It's quite a vivid thing. If any of you ever have the chance of going uh, to this wonderful community, uh, I suggest you go into the IRA Council building and take a look at it because it's, it's, it's stark. Uh, I had heard the stories before, but to actually see it through photos, through photography, because it's basically the same aerial photo as this, okay? And so obviously you see the coast, I mean, the coastline used to be, as of like 50 years ago, I mean, it was out, to, it was out a good ways. I mean, it was out, you know, somewhere here like that. So it's been eroded significantly um, in just, you know, just two generations. So this continues to go on, and anyway, it's a big thing that Kivalina's, you know, uh, they've been negotiating for decades about where to move the community and if they're going to have funds to move it and how they're going to do that and all that sort of stuff. But the point here is that Kivalina is very much representative of coastal Inupak. We're going to use sort of uh, these communities to sort of talk about just, rep you know, representing the culture here, uh, what they mean. So this is... Uh, Numbers would still be pretty similar today. This is as of 2007, okay? Some of the most recent numbers I can get, or at least ones that were reliable. Um, total poundage harvested of different categories of animals in a year in Kivalina, just to give you the idea of the immensity of this. And so, obviously, we can see here with the coastal people, what's emphasized? Well, you're on the coast. Well, I suppose, logically, marine mammals, okay? Uh, now look at the absolute numbers here, 125,000 pounds of marine mammals per year, okay? Big number, a lot, right? Do you know what that mainly consists of? Next slide. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Steve, <laughs> yes. Um, fit, you know, so the point is here, Coastal and Ubach very much emphasizing the marine mammal harvest, right? I mean, we can see that. I mean, it's all, it's what, you know? Almost not not double, but it's 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 getting towards that, uh, uh, you know, over the next major category, which is fishing. Okay, uh, and then you have land mammal that would be like caribou, a few moose, a few uh, a few moose, uh, yes, um, that sort of thing. And then the birds and berries, you know, uh, those are obviously much less than weight. Obviously, still incredibly culturally important, but you know, uh, just a total weight, just not that much. So the point is that they're marine mammal people. Average per person household. Average per person uh, harvest, I should say, almost 600 pounds per person of subsistence food. That's a lot, okay? So just to emphasize the amount here. Um, compare this to previous numbers, you know, over time, uh, you know, marine mammal harvest. Uh, these fluctuate. This is just one comparison. You could do others. You know, uh, basically it's showing that, and this, these trends would sort of be similar to if you uh, had some more data here. Uh, basically that marine mammal harvest has gone up a little bit. Uh, the the, uh, the caribou or land mammal harvest has gone down a little bit over time. Fishing is about the same, so that sort of thing. The other categories are basically a wash, basically the same. So the point is, is that you have a marine mammal culture here on the coastal uh, coastal communities. What does this consist of? Rebecca asked at back there. So this is a breakdown of that. Um, probably the thing to focus on here. Well, the you know biggest at the top, smallest at the bottom, basically. So uh, community total in edible pounds, bearded seal, night almost. You know, over 96,000 pounds in a regular year of bearded seal. So that's most of what's being harvested, right? By a pretty big margin, trout is next. That would be your fish, your main fish, right? And then, so, so talking about marine mammals, bearded seal, also what? Look a whale, right? Uh, 22 total in that year. That's sort of an average size, 22 uh, beluga, okay? Um, for a total of 20, almost 22,000 pounds. Look at the average per person, over 200 average, you know, over 200 pounds per person average in Kivalina of, bearded, of just bearded seal. So the point is, I, you're just showing these numbers to sort of drive home the importance of this, right? Uh, very subsistence reliant here. These are big numbers. Over, you know, over 150 pounds of trout. I know we get a lot of fish in Ketchikan, but still that's, 
you know, for people not doing it commercially. I mean, this is wild food harvest. This is not commercial harvest, understand. So this is, um, uh, what, again, what we generally consider a quote-unquote subsistence. That's a big no. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, uh, I'm, there's okay. the state record for trout size comes out of that river right there. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's huge trout. Yes, yeah, huge and uh, uh, well, let's take a look at the next community. So, um, okay, so marine mammals on the coast—that's pretty logical. So we get a fair amount of difference in subsistence in the inland communities. So this is probably nobody knows this one. The inland can be a little tougher to identify. Uh, no attack. This is the one nearest Kivalina, up in the northwest Arctic. So this is no attack here. Obviously, we've got the uh, the no attack river right here. Uh, so this is a little bit inland from the coast, a typical inland community. Uh, also, just as sort of a, a side note here, um, you see uh, this kind, if, if any of you have not been to the villages in the Yupik or Yupok area, uh, this sort of two-pronged approach to community um, uh, sort of layout, uh, you see that in some of these villages here. If this picture were to extend out over to about here, you would see the airport, the no attack landing strip. And then you come in on this road and it splits off into this part and this part down here. The part up here is basically like an old town where the sort of community started. And then guess what? You know, you get the new school built, and then you get some new housing developments. Uh, you know, some of the prefab stuff uh, coming in here, locating right next to the school, or close to the school. And so you get, to, you, you just see that. If any of you ever uh, eventually get the chance to go out to some of these places, you'll oftentimes see that sort of two-pronged thing uh, in these communities where they'll have the school and the new, newer houses versus sort of the old part of town and that sort of thing. So... Inland, guess what? Different stuff going on there. This is to emphasize sort of the, the differences in culture here. So, you know, inland communities then, guess what? Fishing and caribou. Land mammals, almost exclusively caribou. Okay, we'll see that in a second. Uh, fishing, very important. Trout, no attack trout, some of the best in the world. I've been lucky enough to have some. Um, marine man now, understand that this is actually what residents of these communities harvest, Okay. Um, so they actually, so people in no attack in an inland community, this is not stuff, stuff that they're getting from their families, like exchange. This is actually stuff that they're going out and harvesting. You will actually have folks in no attack, they have boats, they'll actually go out to uh, the sound, they'll go out to the ocean, they'll go out to the Chukchi Sea, and they, I had actually somebody in no attack told me he would go all the way up to Barrow, <coughs> all the way up around the, uh, you know, in his boat for a few days, you know, go, go all the way up into, into the Arctic. And try to get uh, and try to get uh, you know going after whale and stuff like that. So marine mammals are harvested at a pretty good rate. I mean, thirty-three thousand pounds annual average um, in an inland community. So it's still there. It's still part of the culture. But inland people emphasizing the caribou, the trout, and those sorts of things. Okay. So what? Here it's a little less. The average for the community is about 364 pounds of wild food resources uh, per person. Over 100 pounds of caribou per person on average, still a lot. Average per household, over 500 uh, pounds and, you know, over 60,000 total of caribou per year. So a lot of caribou is the point. Um, trout, too, pretty big. So basically, you know, it's, the point is, is that inland and Yupok, very much caribou-focused. Um, coastal and Yupok, very much marine mammal focused is the point I'm trying to make here, okay? So there are those differences and we don't want to, you know, paint, paint with too broad a brush when we use these, gen, you know, these sort of general larger cultural terms. We do want to understand there is a lot of differences between peoples uh, within, within these sorts of regions. Because sometimes we can sort of stereotype and say, you know, culture's all the same up there. No, there's a lot of difference. Let's turn to the economy a little bit and uh, sort of link it to the project that I was working on specifically. So, like a lot of the states, in the Northwest Arctic included, pretty monolithic economies, very natural resource reliant, okay? Um, mostly mining, oil uh, exploration has been going on too, all right? Oil as well. Uh, for example, I worked out of the Northwest Arctic Borough, the borough government up there for the Nana region, and the Red Dog Mine, if any of you are familiar with that, uh, it's the largest zinc producing mine in the world, big one, uh, brings in most of the borough revenues, 80%. So that's certainly what we would consider a monolithic economy. Most of, the, most of the money is coming from one thing, 
okay? Other sources, ancillary, may, basically it's the Red Dog Mine. That's up near <coughs> Tivolina, Noatak, those communities that we just looked at. That's where the mine is. And so the point is, is that the borough, the regional corporation, NANA, is trying to develop the region. Uh, you know, certainly NANA is very supportive of natural resource development, of oil exploration, of mining, of continuing to develop mining in other areas of, of that part of the state. And so this is part of, well, let me transition to this. So the Red Dog Mine, that's where that is. And so this is looking at the Nana region here. That's where the Red Dog Mine is. One of the big potential projects that's being proposed, if anybody's familiar with it, is this Ambler Mining District here in the inland part of the region. It's in red there, okay? Big project here is the, the potential of a road going in to access a lot of copper, zinc, in here, Nova Copper was the company that was uh, has been trying to develop this and get a road in. Uh, I, they've changed their name since I worked there a few years ago. They were Nova, Nova Copper when I was uh, working out of the borough. They've since changed their name. I'm not sure what, what they're called now. But either way, um, this is part of the larger uh, past gubernatorial administration, Sean Parnell, Roads to Resources, if you heard about that program. Uh, this is part of that, the Ambler Mining Road. And so the, this is not built yet, but essentially what it is is, is, is it would link uh, the Dalton Highway about 200 miles going west inland to access the Ambler Mining District, this copper and zinc area, okay? And it would go over, uh, there are different proposed routes. One goes south, but one of them would go over gates of the Arctic National Park, part of that as well. And obviously then this is one of these things, road development, mining development, oil development, all these things, that the borough is concerned about, Nana's pretty, you know, okay with going ahead with these things because they're, you know, for-profit corporation. They need to, you know, look at that sort of thing. The borough is, uh, you know, somewhat positive, somewhat negative on it. They want to make sure that they protect subsistence rights as well. Okay, and we'll talk about how that links up with this subsistence mapping in just a second. This is another uh, look at this here. The road. This is the larger Roads to Resources project uh, under Sean Parnell. Uh, now, you know, understand that obviously with the big uh, financial hit that our state is taking, uh, the, uh, the 3.6 million uh, that's needed for the, uh, for the Ambler Mining Road, it's still, it was technically allocated a few years ago, and so it's technically still there. There's actually environmental um, uh, studies going on right now to, uh, uh, to, to possibly move this forward. So just because we're in, you know, a little more dire financial straits doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to happen. Uh, because that money was technically allocated uh, for this project a few years ago. And so the Ambler Mining Road could still uh, potentially still be built uh, within the next, you know, uh, however many years. So it's still very much on the plate. Um, and here on this map, this is a little messy map, sorry, but basically uh, this is the, you know, in here, this is the sort of road we're looking at there. And of course there are other ones up to coal deposits, other things, uh, the Nome Road that was uh, suggested over to Nome. All that, these are part of uh, the Roads to Resources program. That's, uh, again, part of the past uh, gubernatorial administration. And so what this all comes down to is that uh, I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough uh, because, let me get the other parts of the slide here. I was fortunate enough to be able to work on this project. The borough was concerned about trying to, with all this proposed development going on, all different types, natural resource roads to those natural resources, other things, uh, to try to balance development with subsistence because, again, you know, half of the daily diet coming from these things, you know, coming from uh, hunting, fishing, gathering, want to be able to protect that for the residents there. That's incredibly important on a day-to-day -day basis and balance that with development. So, okay, we have development that comes in. We have the Ambler Road that comes in, all these sorts of things. So how can we, you know, work around sort of our high-use subsistence areas? so we can keep that intact while maybe also, you know, possibly pursuing some forms of development, that sort of thing. And so uh, the Northwest Arctic Borough got $1.8 million and mostly federal, some private funds, a four-year project that I was uh, fortunate enough to work on the first couple of years and design the methods for. And so what we, what we were uh, uh, given to do was try to produce maps identifying high use and traditional subsistence areas uh, in the region. And we were focusing on we only had enough money for the seven nearest to coast communities in the Nana region. So that's Kivalina, Noatak, uh, Kotzebue, Norvik, Selawik, Buckland, and Deering. Uh-oh. 
Hello. And Deary. So the seven nearest to the coast. Uh, the other ones, uh, you know, uh, tried to get money for couldn't, but we basically did the nearest to the coast. Now understand that doesn't necessarily cover the Ambler Mining District, uh, but, you know, this was back before the oil price drop, and so a lot of the, the concern back then was oil, uh, you know, oil development, especially on the coast and that sort of thing. So it's still very much relevant to that, uh, but also sort of shows, shows uh, some general patterns and other things and ways to sort of uh, approach this type of project and how it can hopefully correctly be done. So I was working as the anthropologist for this project, and I was given a very nice job. I was out to design the methods for it. And so basically this represented most of the borough communities. Uh, I ended up putting together sort of a combination of interview and focus groups. Uh, we put together seven elders and high harvesters, basically those people that uh, harvest. Uh, if you look at any studies of, uh, of North Arctic villages, you see that there are particular households, particular people that tend to harvest a lot more than other households and then distribute that out to other households, okay? So we wanted to focus on high harvesters, elders, people that have a lot of knowledge uh, in these communities about where, you know, subsistence is done, where these things are done, you know, today and have been in the past. So we could map these places and hopefully potentially preserve them from road development, oil development, mining development, all these sorts of things, okay? And so then uh, we were basically, as project staff, I as the lead anthropologist, uh, you know, we were basically shown where to draw on maps uh, based on what informants the people, these, uh, the, you know, the elders and high harvesters told us. And so this is a letter of interest, like for Norvik. Uh, we passed this out in the communities. You know, are you an elder, a hunter, a fisherman, a gatherer, all those things, any of them uh, that apply? Uh, you know, we got a lot of contacts uh, in the communities and, you know, said sign up. Uh, you know, we'd uh, very much like, uh, like to have your knowledge input and in all this to help uh, preserve subsistence. And so many people got on board. We'll talk about how that happened in just a second. And, uh, and this is sort of the way that people would apply. We'd go out in the, in the communities and do a lot of hearings, do a lot of community meetings, round tables, those sorts of things. Uh, to get some buy-in for this, obviously, we had support of the... Uh, of the borough up there. We were working on the North Historic Borough and the mayor, the borough mayor at the time. And so we had four meetings uh, per year for two years, okay? Walrus hunting on the uh, photo there. Uh, this was supplemented with some semi-structured interviews, basically sort of open-ended interviews where we would talk about just the practice of subsistence, hunting, fishing, gathering, all that stuff, how it was done, what was important uh, to new uh, people about that. TEK, that's basically a technical term for traditional uh, environmental knowledge. Basically covers what you talk about when you talk about these things. So we did interviews, we did focus groups. This was qualitative and quantitative too. We did GIS, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, specifically for the maps and some more specific mapping that we did. Uh, so it was, you know, we got, uh, we got notes, we got uh, all this knowledge written down, other things. And uh, we transferred this all to GIS, Geographic Information Systems, ArcGIS. It's a nice program that puts together maps. Uh, very nicely, the sort of um, GPS sort of uh, data points, that sort of thing. And this is kept on the borough server with approved access only. Now, I have to say, I'm sorry to say, I'm actually not going to be able to show you any maps uh, here in this uh, talk tonight. I can't. Um, as uh, project staff, we actually signed contracts that this is proprietary to uh, people in the Nana region, people in the Northwest Arctic region, so I actually cannot take this out, take that information out or publish it or give it in a talk anywhere else. So I'm sorry I actually can't show you those maps, but we'll be able to talk about the importance of this of this project, hopefully. And hopefully this is actually showing that it works. I can't show you that. So the new pop people should have priority to that. It's not my information, you know, so I can talk generally about the project, but I can't actually show you where folks go. Okay? That's probably that should be a good thing. It's a little slow here. So some study contributions here. Um, just sort of what we learned, maybe some best practices, things that can sort of help, you know, these type of projects uh, that can be valuable uh, when trying to protect these sorts of things. Uh, and I'll just mention these and then sort of try to go through. I don't have too much time left. Um, uh, go through a little more of these in depth. Uh, we, we used, uh, we, we had, uh, we hired interns of a certain sort. We'll talk about that. Actually, let me just go ahead and I'll just skip through this because I don't have too much time. I don't want to take too much more of your time. Let me talk about the sort of first thing here. Interns. 
we think of interns, we think of college, right? We think of university. Uh, we think of maybe like high school seniors, you know, going to get coffee for the producer or something, internships, right? Unpaid or paid, uh, maybe slave labor, that sort of stuff. Um, so when I went up there, you know, we had, we had a budget in this project for three interns for two years, and each of these interns were basically to cover each set of villages. So one for Deering and Buckland, one for uh, No Attack and Kivalina, sort of the neighboring villages. We were, we were to have three of them. Part-time job, 20, 20 hours per week, that sort of thing, for a couple of years. Nice job, you know, good uh, part-time wage, that sort of thing. Um, so we, you know, we started the first month or two trying to get applications, and we got some young people. You know, we were advertising for, you know, sort of that college age crowd and that sort of thing. And we got, a, we got like two or three applications back. We talked to them. You know, they were okay. You know, interesting, interest, interesting kids and stuff. And they're like, we we're a little bit disappointed though. You know, one was going to, you know, she wanted to go and work at the hospital. You know, didn't really have any sort of future or career you know, in, you know, interest in, like, environmental stuff or anything, wasn't really, you know, connected very much with what the project was. Like, okay, well, maybe we should sort of think outside the box a little bit. Uh, so what we ended up doing was talking with a lot of the people that worked at the borough. They started to mention these names of, like, you know, guys around the communities, uh, especially middle-aged guys, that were looking for part-time work, some of them high harvesters. And we were like, well, why don't we just, you know, hire them as interns? They could use the work. Uh, you know, they're sort of seasonal. Understand that a lot of people up here are seasonal subsistence, you know, they may work part-time through the year, you know, may do some, you know, may do hunting, fishing, gathering, the rest of the, you know, other half of the year. And so there's sort of partial employment. There's obviously full employment too. So uh, these are two, uh, these are a picture of two of our interns. Uh, one Enoch Mitchell uh, on the uh, on the left there. Uh, the other Alvin Ashby on the right. Uh, fortunately, Alvin is not facing us here. Uh, both incredibly knowledgeable, uh, incredibly well-spoken representatives of their communities, uh, both what we, could, we would consider high harvesters, Alvin especially, uh, one of the best-known fishers and, uh, and, and both uh, marine mammal and land mammal hunters uh, out of no attack. And so they were wonderful. This idea of sort of hiring people that are, could also be a part of your project really gave us credibility uh, you know, because it was myself, another outsider that was not from the area that were sort of <coughs> running this study, essentially. And so, you know, a couple of, you know, white outsiders come in, you know, start to try to talk to Native folks, you get a little suspicious, right? What's going on? And so to be able to have good relations and integrate uh, folks that were already had a lot of credibility in the region, like we would go to communities and we said Alvin Ashby was on the project, and like, oh, yeah, we know him, you know. Uh, you know, we, we had sort of instant credibility with this. Uh, it, was an, it was sort of an excellent way to show that, you know, uh, this sort of thing could be trusted, this sort of project that was, you know, uh, people didn't necessarily know about uh, could be trusted and that sort of thing when we had uh, folks like this giving input and really integrated into it. And so uh, helping to translate, uh, one of the other uh, um, uh, interns we had, Lee Ballot out of uh, Norvik, had uh, some Inupak uh, experience, and so he could help translate. And so uh, we also, uh, you know, they also gave interviews. Uh, we even uh, had our interns give interviews and be part of the project. That really wasn't a, um, a, a you know, sort of conflict of interest. Uh, they were just as, you know, knowledgeable as others. And so it really, that, you know, using adult interns, essentially, we, had, uh, we eventually uh, called them ambassadors. Uh, we didn't use the term intern. Uh, a little more apropos for adult males, okay, so... Uh, we actually officially changed that. The grants at interns, we eventually officially changed it to read ambassador. So, you know, they're not interns. Come on. Uh, this is Lee Ballot. Um, Lee, a very well-read man, always was in reports, uh, probably the most well-read of the three, and uh, he's, uh, he was another one of our interns, or ambassadors, excuse me. And so, you know, they also helped. The other thing, I mean, we could have, you know, we... It would have been nice income for the kids, certainly, but they came from sort of well-off families. It was also kind of an inefficient use of money, too. It's like, well, you know, the, these guys have pretty big families. They could use the part-time income. Why not do that, too? It's just a part of it. So and we want to try to get more efficiency than just hiring. I shouldn't say just hiring some kids. You know, it's, it can be a very valuable thing. Of course, most internships are. But in this case, uh, in this specific sort of project, it can sometimes help to get, you know, other types of, uh, other types of help, if you will, uh, besides just you know, trying to get uh, kids through college with an internship. 
Uh, and it gave us experience on staff to it. Real, I mean, they told us how to get into the communities and how to talk with people. I mean, that it, it was uh, project would not have been a success without them. Really, that would, I, I cannot emphasize that enough. So it's something that we try to emphasize. Uh, you know, when we go around to talk about this to other folks that are doing this type of work, saying, hey, this is certainly something that you can do. One more thing here, and I'll sort of end with this because we're almost at an hour and I don't want to, you know, take up too much time. Um, this idea that, I try to focus on what to emphasize here. Um, I'll do it visually, since you're probably sick of the text. This is not actually a map from our study. This is from a fish and game study, but it's kind of close to the analogy that I want to use here. When we started out, we had our first round of meetings. We would go in, we would take maps, we would take topographic maps, kind of, sim you know, kind of similar to what these look like. We would sit them down in front of people, you know, elders, high harvesters, all these very knowledgeable guys. Uh, we would sit down, and so the first round of meetings, we kind of had a lot of trouble. People were kind of circling sort of just big swath general areas, you know, like, oh, well, okay, well, we were looking for where people search and where they harvest, those two things. Where, you know, where those things occur. And so basically like, well, you know, okay, we go search for beluga whale, you know, all along the sound. This is Kivalina, like search and harvest areas around Kivalina. Actually what Fish and Game found, very similar to what we found, these sort of, these sort of areas. So like, yeah, you know, yeah, we, we, we go here, you know. They would circle this sort of big area. Like, okay, well, where do you go caribou hunting? Well, we go, you know, we go all around here. These are, I mean, they're circling very big areas, right? Now that's very now it's very valuable, of course. Uh, you could probably circle the whole Nana region and call it a subsistence area, and you would and you would be you would be correct, certainly. Okay, but this was kind of disappointing to the borough as well. It brought you know bring these sorts of things back, you know these sort of big circled areas. Like, well, that's very nice, but you know when we start, you know if we have to negotiate, you know a road, you know any type of development somewhere, big large circles are not going to help us too much. You know, we need, maybe need a little more specific information. So what we found was that, uh, well, here, I'll give you another example of this. Like, no attack, same thing. You know, the first set of meetings, we just get these sort of, and we had, um, uh, we had this sort of scale of maps as well. Sometimes we, we, we have more zoomed-in maps as well, um, 1 to 65,000, 1 to 32,000, if anybody knows your map scales, like 1 to 1, 1 inch to 1 mile sort of uh, sort of maps, those sorts of scales as well. Um, but we get these sort of big swath areas. And so, okay, again, that's, you know, that's nice, but, you know, that's not really going to help us. What we found was that we went back into the lab, so to speak, and we we're like, well, what are we going to do next time? If we keep getting this, you know, yeah, this is, this is very symbolic and very nice, but, you know, is this really going to be practical? Is this going to be a valuable project? And so what we did was we had some money in our grant, and we found that it sounds kind of intuitive to say it this way, but we got outside. Anthropologists tend to historically have, when they do mapping projects like this, what do they do? They tend to sit in a room, you know, lay the map out, talk with an elder, and try to map out things around the table. Much better to go outside and actually see things in person. So what we did was, it was kind of like, duh, let's try this. We, you know, our next, our second set of meetings were in the spring. You know, things were thawing out a little bit. We could get outside a little bit more easily. And so we decided to take some boat trips upriver, other places, take our GIS, and then we could go and actually map these things out, GIS points, and all that sort of stuff. This actually worked incredibly well. I was surprised at the differences. Going out, seeing things visually, like being out just upriver, like everybody started to green. There are like specific points. Like, oh, yes, this is where we go. Because people were out, you know, actually going to the places that they went in real life. And so it sounds, you know, sort of, in, I suppose, maybe an intuitive thing. But a lot of the way this has been done historically has been sort of sitting down in the room. Maybe even 100 years ago when anthropology first started, it was like by the oil lamp, light, whatever, you know, and mapping things out. You know, pen and paper and all that stuff. But if you actually go out and do what is called a practice approach and actually go out where people actually do these things, we found that we got a lot, not only a lot of agreement on things, but we got a lot of specific points mapped as well. And so it really became a big thing. It was actually kind of funny. Excuse me. Um, I was working on this in uh, 2011 through 2013. It was just a year prior to this. 
that um, there is a subsistence mapping project, a very similar thing going on with the Pacific Islands, that actually said the same thing, basically. That they did almost exactly the same thing. Like they, this was in the Solomon Islands in Melanesia. They were trying to map, protect, you know, try to protect fishery areas, that sort of thing. That they tried to do the sort of paper mapping with people, and people just didn't get it. They were just like, they didn't know what to do. Took them outside, took them on the water, they could map everything. They could tell you exactly where they did everything and all that sort of stuff. So, was, so we, you know, basically, cr you know, corroborated that, uh, you know, uh, uh, agreed with that just a couple of years later. Unfortunately, we couldn't publish that, but uh, you know, we uh, uh, we found that out. And it also, it kind of, uh, it kind of supports a more recent thing. Just uh, something was just published within the past year or so, 2015, Pacific Islands again. It shows that indigenous people tend to uh, use things like satellite imagery much better for mapping than things like topographic maps because it's more visual. So that's sort of a way to do mapping, sort of a method to do as well. And so anyway, I won't, uh, I'm trying to think what else I should catch here. Um, these are some of the pictures uh, out uh, doing this practice approach. Um, so anyway, I'll just go through. Uh, okay, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm skipping to the end. So anyway, I'll end with some tundra tea. Um, but anyway, those are some of the main things we found from our subsistence mapping. Arigate ku, which is much thanks uh, in Mubok, and tundra tea there for you. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, uh, everybody, for coming.